this series, the summer series that we're in right now, Better We Than Me. Okay, so Pastor Brandon hit on that last week, did an amazing job, and he talked about the importance as we, as a body of Christ, what we can do. He talked about the hala hala, he talked about all the ingredients, and how we're masterfully put together for the work of ministry. But sometimes I think, in my mind, in my heart, that we don't know who me is, and if you don't know who you are, you don't know what you offer and what you can give to the body of Christ. And so we're in an age right now where um, we know who we are in a certain way. So like uh, professionally and our politics, our identity, our gender, our race, our uh, standings are. But I'm not talking about the, how you identify on LinkedIn. How many of you guys are on LinkedIn? See, we're getting younger already as the service, as the ages go up in the time. Uh, so, you know, not talking about she, her, or uh, they, them, or I read Pastor Brandon's profile. He was the man. So I, that was awesome. I liked the man. That was cool. My wife said, do not use gender plural. She warned me against this, but still did it. Um, it's identifying who we are professionally and who we are in all these different ways, but that's not what I'm talking about. We need to know me as Christ defines me so we can be the we that God has called us to. So how do we define it? So the first scripture I want to talk to you about is Ephesians 1, 4 through 6. And it says this, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us and the one he loves. The me that we are is not defined in the what we do or the pedigree that we are or how we are raised or what school we went to. You know, I went to Kaiser, and then I went to KCC, Kaiser Continuation Classes, um, <laughs> up by Diamond Head. And then I went to the mainland and, and did grad school and whatever else. But that's not who me is. Me is who the Father says that I am, and who I am in the sonship of Jesus Christ. Do you understand that? So the interesting thing is we, we talk about something called the Pauline Theology. And Pauline theology is really the basis of our evangelical faith. And it says this, Abraham was called righteous because of his faith in God. Okay, so let's go back. Uh, Abraham before he was father, Abraham and many sons. Before that, he was Abraham, old Kapuna guy, old wife, no kids. Okay, and he was in a tent one day. And God spoke to Abraham and said, Abraham, come out of your tent and look up to the sky. So Abraham got out of his tent, probably back hurt a little bit, got out. And the Lord said, as the stars are in the sky, will be your descendants. And Abraham didn't say, hey, you see my wife? No. He didn't say, hey, have you seen me? No. He said, let it be so according to your will. Okay? So the Bible says, because Abraham's faith in God, he was called righteous. Okay? So our Pauline theology, Paul, the Apostle Paul says, our faith is determined by our belief in God. Because we believe in and we have faith, we're called righteous. So today your me doesn't qualify because of what you do and who you are. Your me qualifies because you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Amen? So that gets the work parts out of it. Because I don't want to go into the me, me, me. But society constantly drives us there. So let me ask you this. When you meet a little kid, what's the first thing you say? Hey, how are you? What's your name? What do you want to do when you grow up? Right? Now, when I meet you, I come up to you, so, hey, what do you do? Tell me what you do. If we're at the Kapuna service and we're talking to someone older, we say, hey, so what did you do? Crazy, yeah? And it's not like, 
it's not shocking because 90,000 hours of our lives are spent at work. So we do sometimes define ourselves in this way, but God never defines us in that way. We have to embrace the calling of God in our lives and the understanding of who we are because of who he says we are. But that doesn't mean, and at least for me when I was growing up, I thought to believe in God and to really be passionate and excited about God, that I had to join the ministry. And so I had to be a pastor. I had to go into ministry. I had to, if I'm really devout to God, then I've got to become a youth pastor. And I'm just going to tell you right now, who of you feel called to be a pastor? Oh, so good. It's terrible. Don't do it. It pays terrible. And you got to wake up early on the weekends. Yeah, I can keep going, but it's bad. It's, ask, ask everybody else. But for the rest of us, we feel like, well, then are we really doing what God's called us to do in this world? Are we really followers of Christ? Am I really terribly devout? Am I really, really that person? I think at times of our lives when we were younger, we probably did volunteer more. We probably did commit more. We probably did try to do outreaches. I remember going to Philippines as a kid to Hope Chapel, Baguio City, where we used to build and, and paint walls and then they'd knock them down and the next year we'd come build them again and paint them and we used to help on missions. But I want to talk to you about really the body of Christ and who we are. We are made up of a compilation of about 12 tribes. If we look at ancient Israel and in 12 tribes, there was only one tribe that was the clergy tribe and that was called the Levites. That's right. 501s. No, that was called the Levite tribe, right? And the Levite tribe did all the work in the church. They did all the ministry stuff. They did all the sacrifices. They barbecued the meat and they did everything like that. But what about the other 11 tribes that is us, the church? How come we don't talk about that too often as a body of Christ? It's almost that we focus on the one tribe that are Levites up here, and we don't talk about the 11 tribes that is you and is there. If we're ever trusting the fate of the world to pastors, guess what? <laughs> we're in trouble because we're here all the time. We're the church mice. We're doing all the work and the meetings and getting everything together. The real work of the ministry, the we of the work of the ministry is you. You are so important to the body of Christ. You are so important to the fate of this world. You are so important to a dying world. You are so important in any workplace that you're in, any calling that you're in, whether it's customer service, whether it's real estate, whether it's construction, whether it's banking, whether it's business, whatever it is to you that you do is the most important thing to the we that is the body of Christ. See, we have to understand something. When the Israelites were in the wilderness, God said to them, let me build a temple so I can dwell amongst you. Okay? Let me go to scripture and, and read you some of this right here. I found my extra piece of paper. I lost less service. So I, I have the scripture this time. It was terribly embarrassing. They all laughed at me and threw stuff at me. It was terrible. Okay. Then the rulers of the father's households and the princes of the tribes of Israel and the commanders of thousands of hundreds with the overseers of the king's work offered willingly and for the service of the house of God. They gave 5,000 talents, 10 derricks of gold, and 10,000 talents of silver, and 18,000 talents of brass, and 100,000 talents of iron. Whoever pressed precious stones gave the treasury of the house of the Lord. Then the people rejoiced because they offered so willingly, for they made their offerings to the Lord and their whole heart. And the king David also rejoiced greatly. The Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites, bring me an offering. You are to receive my offerings from every man whose heart compels them. This is the offering you are to accept for them. Gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, scarlet yarn, fine linen and goat hair, ram skins, dyed red and fine leather, acacia wood, oil for lighting, spices for anointing oil, and the fragrant incense and onks. 
other gemstones to be mounted to the ephod and breastplate so it could be one piece. And they are made to make a sanctuary for me so that I may dwell amongst them. You must make the tabernacle and design all its furnishings according to the pattern that I will show you. We look at all those interesting ingredients, right? So um, I happen to have a ring I wore today. It's onx, so I'm, I'm in. Um, and I'm also Jewish and, and Chinese and Samoan. Just so I know I'm a big mix, poi dog. Um, but all these different things that God called the people to build the temple were all things that they already did and were characteristic of them. Some theologians like to take a lot of liberties to tell that the goat skin and the thread makers and all of a sudden just learned that kind of work like right there and then in the middle of the wilderness and came up with all these things to build the temple. But I'm going to tell you right now, the temple was built characteristic to the people of God and what they already had possessed and were trained to do. It wasn't some special, you know, come up with this and go train to do this and, and become a ministry leader and get a, get a seminary degree. It wasn't go try to figure out something and then someday we can build the temple to the Lord. It was no, people of God right now, whatever you do in your teaching and your training and your working and your hammer, whatever it is, let us build a temple of God in Kalihi today so God might be honored in the work that we do. Amen? You don't need to change to serve the Lord. For you to be you, so you can say me, for us to be we, we have to embrace our calling in the marketplace. We have to embrace our calling in wherever our feet find us to be. Some people say, well, how do I find calling? Your calling is right where you are right now. Well, where is my mission field? It's the thing that's in front of you right now. Well, what am I to do? And the very thing that God has put in your hand to do, do it unto the Lord, for it is the glory of God through you that the world might know that he is good. Amen? So I think about three stages in life that we go through. And the first stage is uh, survival, right? So you guys, sorry to pick on you, but you got the lays. And so uh, right now you're in survival. Okay, so you're going to figure out really quick that school is expensive and gas is crazy expensive. Um, I used to fill up in Hawaii, it was 98 cents. Wow. And I'm not even the oldest person here. Who remembers 25 cents? Oh, brother over there does. 10 cents? Okay, we'll stop at 25. You win, 25 cents. Okay. You're going to find out gas is expensive. You're going to find out it's hard to pay for school. You're going to find out it's hard to get a job. You're going to find out that it's all about survival right now. How do I put things together? How do I, how do I work this out? How do I take classes? How do I graduate? How do I balance my social life? How do I balance my finances and, and learn to borrow more money from my parents? And, and how am I going to do all this stuff? And that's the first stage of our life, right? Is survival. But then some of you, and I, I think me, is we're, we're getting to the stable part of life. You know, maybe we have a good rent or a good mortgage. We are able to afford to live in Hawaii. Congratulations to all of us because that's kind of hard these days. Most of my friends move to the mainland, Ninth Island or, or otherwise, Idaho, I don't know why, but people move. And we try to find stability. And stability sometimes is, hey, I have a house, I have a family, I can afford to get a dog now. Um, I can buy a car and it's not super junk, it actually runs and I can do other things and that's the place of stability and that's the place that most of us stay. We stay in this place where we bought into, oh, I'm living up to the American dream. And what is the American dream? Well, humanism says that the American dream is the end of all man is happiness, right? That's humanism. But God didn't call us to happiness or promise happiness. He did in heaven someday. God called us to so much more. See, the end of all Christianity is that God would receive the reward of his suffering on the cross. That God would be lifted higher and higher. That all men would know him. That all men would experience Christ and know Christ. 
that's the end of all men as Christians. But sometimes we get the stability mixed up with the American dream and we stop as believers. Do you by any chance of the Chuck Norris slide up there? I don't know if it made it into the deck. But sometimes, I, I saw this on 4th of July, happy birthday to Jesus, son of America. Okay, that's supposed to be a lot funnier, guys. Come on, I mean, <laughs> definitely not making it to the next service. But sometimes people think that the America and the American dream and, and 2.5 kids and owning a house and that's stability and I made it in life. But today I would challenge us to this. It's not about stability that walk with Christ. That's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to move to the next stage, which I call significance. Significance is that place where I say, Lord, all that I am, all that you created me to be, all that you've put in me, my talents, my gifts, my callings, my family, my proximity of where I live and who I am and the geography of where I'm at, Lord, I offer that to you. I give me to you for God's sake. I want to move into a place of significance in my life that all that I am, all that I do is used to the glory of God. Amen? Let me read you a quote uh, that I think is really timely. Um, it starts with this. When we say the Christian work from a gospel worldview, it does not mean that we're constantly speaking about Christian teachings and their work. Some people think of the gospel as something we are principally to look at in our work. This would mean that Christian musicians should only play Christian music. Christian writers should only write stories about conversions. And Christian businesswomen and businessmen should work only for companies that make Christian themed products, services for Christian customers. Have you ever seen the Christian air freshener in the car? No, nobody? How about the Christian nightlight? No. The Christian rug? No. You guys got to go to the Christian bookstore. They got Christian everything. You get pens, shirts, socks, everything Christian. Okay. Yes, some Christians in those fields would sometimes do well to do those things. But it's a mistake to think that Christian worldview is operating only when we are doing such overt Christian activities. Instead, think of the gospel as a set of glasses which you look at everything else in the world through. Christians, when they do this faithfully, will not be completely beheld to either profit or, or losing profit or making profit, but to a naked self-expression alone. Christians in business will see profit as only one of the bottom lines and they will work passionately for any kind of enterprise that serves the common good. Does that make sense? That's Pastor Tim Keller out of a, one of his faith and work books. And what I like about what Tim's saying is sometimes when the me and me when it comes to God, we think that if, well, if I do real estate, I got to have a fish on everything and I got to get everybody saved that buys a house for me. And if I'm a plumber, every sink that I fix, I got to leave a track underneath the sink between the Clorox bleach and the, and the, you know, the, the Folex carpet cleaner. And if I'm a uh, school teacher, then I got to make sure that I'm, I'm, you know, pulling the kids aside in the hallway and telling about Christian Andy all the time. But we're talking about when God has made you because of the quality, because of the expression, because of the integrity inside of you, because of the business values that you have, because of the sincerity that you administer to people, they are seeing Christ in you as the hope of glory. That is your witness. That is your calling. Sometimes we think when we want to be good Christians, we got to go hang up the sign, turn or burn, right? And we got to be, I was in Waikiki the other day and it was like literally turn or burn. I was like, really? We're still doing that, huh? How's that working for you? You know, how big's your church? You know, and literally I stopped and took a picture. I said, this would be good for the Metro message. Uh, I forgot to bring it. But we think that we got to go out there and we got to proselytize. But the Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they would see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. Is Rob here today, the, the one that makes lace? Anybody know Rob? Um, the man that makes these lays is a blessing to this church. 
I mean, I, I feel blessed and honored by this lay. And Rob does that out of his lay business that he does. Frida, in her ministry and the work that she does and her cooking ability, is blessing all of us today. I'm going to be blessed. I'm going to hold on to Frida for a couple of years probably after today. You know, two minutes on the lips, 20 years on the hips. Um, you know, she, we're blessing. Let me talk about an ancient person that blessed um, that you may not think as a historical Christian figure, but William Wilberforce. William Wilberforce in the early, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, um, asked the Lord as a businessman, and as a politician, he said, Lord, how do I bless my community? How do I bless my city? People were dying of this weird thing called a pandemic. I don't know if you guys have heard of one. You wear a mask, people get sick all the time, they get other people sick. It's a big thing. Uh, someday, you know, if you read about history, you'll learn about pandemics. And the reason people were dying was because they were taking all their dead and just simply moving them out of town on the, on the village walls and just stacking their dead people because they didn't know what to do with dead people. And William sought the Lord and said, Lord, we have a crazy disease coming from these dead bodies. What do we do with this? And the Lord said, bury them six feet under. And so William went to the city council and the county council members. And he said, guys, I got a great idea. He didn't say, oh, thus saith the Lord. You know, he just said, hey, I got a great idea. And they knew he was a Christian man. And they, he said, let's bury our dead six feet under. Thus was the first graveyard ever. And the disease left their town. All to the glory and the power of God. Because God is a God of intellect. God is a God of business. God is a God of education. God is a God of construction. God is a God of, of HR. He's a God of financing. God's a CFO. He's a CEO. He's a CMO. He's a CTO. He's a CSO. He's all the C-suites and everything in between. See, he started the Bible as a gardener. And when he came to earth, he was a carpenter. The me that you are, the me, is not ministry me, it's me, Christ in me, is the hope of glory, which is the ministry to a dying world. Not because we're overtly Christian, not because we do a certain thing, but it's the Christ inside of us that allows us to bless and to do and to serve. Do you know you are a blessing? You are the most Christian you can possibly be. You in your field and your craft are not less than somebody that devotes themselves to the church all the time. You are the hope of glory. Because of you, we can impact a dying world. I think of a man uh, that I work with here in the islands and uh, he owns a housing building company and uh, builds a lot of houses, Leeward, Eva, um, great, great home company, one of the big fives. And uh, little did I know when I had lunch with him that I discovered that he had built 523 homes for Hawaiian homelands at cost. So we're not talking little sheds. We're not talking like, you know, makeshift kind houses. We're talking four bedroom, three bath kind homes in the islands. Not for 1.9, 2.4, like they go market, for cost like 200, 250,000. Because he saw the need of the, the list, right? We know the list. Heard about the list our whole lives. We have aunties and uncles that have been on the list for 60, 70, 80 years. And this Christian man started saying, hey, I'm going to start serving the list. And he has another track contract coming up with them where he's going to build more Hawaiian homeland homes at cost. How many of you guys know that witness of that man is doing more than I'm doing right now on Sunday morning? Him giving generosity where he's not just looking at the bottom line of what could be for his company. He's looking at the kingdom bottom line. There's another man on South King Street that I used to work with on the mainland. You guys hear a tiger bomb? Remember tiger bomb? You put it on your joints. You smell like Bengay, right? You stink really bad, but you feel better. Well, he created uh, Kenneth Young. He's on South King Street. He created Tiger Bomb. The money and the profits that he built with Tiger Bomb, he's been doing underground churches in different parts of Asia for years now. Hundreds of thousands of people coming to the Lord in Asian countries that cannot have Christ because of the profits he made off of his Tiger Bomb product. So go buy a Tiger Bomb. No, uh, that's not the point. <laughs> I'm an Icy Hot fan. I'm sorry, Ken. Um, but the point is, is that 
everything that you do to the glory of God. See, when you know me and stop trying to be me or us or they or someone you see on TV or this, that, and that, and you understand who me really is, then we become the most shining example of Christ on this earth together. Because you are the temple of God in this place. You are the thing that God has called. You are the thing that God has made. How many of you guys have felt less than as a Christian because you don't serve at a church? Anybody? Yeah. I, I consulted for the last five years. Yeah, I sometimes felt less than because I wasn't coordinating the songs and, and doing this and doing that. And I think that's maybe the biggest lie of the enemy is to get us to believe that we're not good enough and that we have nothing to offer God. How many teachers are here today? Any teachers? What you do in teaching is one of the most remarkable things on this earth. I'm so proud that we have MCA getting to kids at pre-kindergarten so they can learn and understand and be educated and be taught because we know pre-kindergarten, I didn't go to pre-kindergarten, that's probably my problem, but pre-kindergarten, you're way more likely to go to college when you've been to a pre-kindergarten. We understand that third grade reading levels are of paramount importance and it actually correlates with the recidivism rate of people going to prison. Teachers, what you do is so important. Every single thing you do to the glory of God. Amen? A job is a vocation only if someone else calls you to do it. For them rather than yourself. And so our work can be a calling only if it is reimagined as missions. Of service to something beyond merely our own interest. Thinking of work mainly as a means for self-fulfillment and self-realization will just simply crush people. If work is only a point of self-realization of who I am and your identity, work is going to crush you. If someone's just called you into vocation, it's just going to crush you. But if you start to believe that your work is your primary place of ministry, if you believe that 90,000 hours in your lifetime is something that God has called you to, you're going to bless. You're going to hold people up. You're going to cover people. And you're going to be let the light that so shines that all men see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. This quote by Andy Crouch in his book, Culture Making, Recovering Our Creative Calling. I highly recommend it. He's a theological anthropologist, and he's talking about restoring our gifting and callings as Christian people so we understand who the me that we are. I wonder what Christians are known for in the world outside of our churches. Are we known as critics, consumers, copiers, condemners of culture? I'm afraid so. Why are we known as cultivators, people who tend and nourish what is best in human culture, who do the hard and painstaking work to preserve the best of what people before us have done? Why aren't we known as creators, people who dare to think and do something that has never been done or thought of before? Something that makes the world more welcoming and thrilling and beautiful. Andy in another book talks about the cultures used to, uh, I'm sorry, Christians used to paint the horizon of culture. That Christians led what culture is and culture norms. We painted what was morality. We painted what was acceptable, what was celebrated. Hospitals and orphanages and education. And Christians used to just really tell society where to go and give us guardrails. But now Christianity is trying to mimic and trying to copy and trying to follow culture versus leading and repainting the horizon of culture. Can you repaint the horizon of culture in your workplace? Can you repaint what you do and what you're called to in your workplace? Can you bring new creativity? Can you bring a new calling? I'll end with this story. A friend of mine, Patty, um, in Santa Cruz, California, retired from NASA. And uh, Patty, in his time at NASA, created the $17 million upside down coffee pot. Yes, that's where your tax money went. That's between us. Um, and, you know, because the dynamics of gravity, right? The drip pot. Try flipping with no gravity, it doesn't go down. Huh? Oh, come on. Anyway, that was Patty, not me. He did the Mars rover program, he did the Humble telescope, and then Patty uh, retired in Santa Cruz and he started doing a soup kitchen. 
Awesome, right? I don't know. I went to Patty one day when I met him and I said, Patty, you created so much innovation for NASA. Such crazy, crazy things for the world. But then when it came to serving God, you did a soup kitchen. And I get that, you know, I, I think soup giving is good, right? But I just wanted a little bit more from him, right? And I said, Patty, what is it if God, if you were to say to the, the Lord, Lord, I offer my NASA skills. Lord, I offer all these things to build your temple in Santa Cruz. What would God do if you were to offer him your best? Not just your extra 10%, not just your extra little things, and not just your volunteer hours, but really cultivate a life through Christ as God has called you and designed you using your brain. See, sometimes in ministry, we check our brain at the doors. And then we think, oh, we're just going to do stuff that we know is not systemic. We know that's not going to be super impactful, but it's the only option that we have to serve, right? God's calling us into more as the, as the we. He wants us to start engaging the brain more in the we. So Patty comes to me literally the next week. I'm not even lying. And he does the Lolo van, okay? It's called Loads of Love van. Sounds kind of Hawaiian. Uh, Lolo. Who's the Lolo that stole my pocket Lolo? Oh, sorry. Uh, just remember that song back in the day. It's so catchy. Um, but the, the Lolo van, and it was featured on Fox News like that night. And it was a van, and it had a flip down TV, and it had a washer and dryer, and it was solarized, which was crazy. And he put all his engineering hours into this van. And he would drive into the homeless encampments, and then he would do their laundry. I don't know, maybe they're in their when they're sitting there. Maybe give them a towel. I don't know how he did it. But um, that's TMI for me. Um, and then he would flip down the movie screen. He had on like garage tracks and he'd pull it down. And then he would show the Jesus movie and then talk to him about Jesus. Hey, most of us, pretty good. Not too bad, right? Oh, there it is. Right on. Thank you. The booth is doing an amazing job because I don't really follow notes so much. And so it's just really complicated. So this is Patty Brady on the left-hand side, and that's Tom McKellen on his right. So that's the Lolo van on the right-hand side. And uh, I said, you know, that's really cool, but you did the Mars Rover program. Like, come on, like, this is cool, right? Like, I'm not poo-pooing it, but you could do a little bit more than that. So Patty said, okay, and he talked to Tom, and Tom created the LED algorithm for RGBW. So red, green, blue, these lights right here. Well, when you add white, which I think these ones have, it's RGBW, right? And that goes from thousands of lights to millions of light combinations. And Tom was also retired, doing nothing, but he created the LED algorithm. And then you have Patty that did all these crazy things in NASA. And I said, guys, you could do better than a van. So what else can we do? So they prayed and said, Lord, I just want to offer what I have. Not some creative idea that I have nothing to do with laundry and I've never created vans. Well, Tom, you did LED lights, so what can we do with LED lights? So we started finding homeless veterans all over the place and there was a high per capita in that region. So it was where we were, that was the problem that was right in front of us. So for us in Kalihi, there's Palama Settlement, there's the preschool, there's our neighbors, there's our under-resourced communities. So right where they were, with the tools that they had already, which was the LED industry, they created an LED solar factory. And we employed homeless veterans to come in and be able to work four hours, two hours, six hours, eight hours, whatever have you. And we started doing grow lights for vegetables to nourish the community, the veterans, and start cultivating life. And you could show that slide. Mike was a veteran on the left-hand side, is a veteran. This was some of the aquaponic, aeroponics, and hydroponics that we started creating. And all of a sudden, these grow lights started getting picked up by plant sciences because all of a sudden, the innovation and the things that they thought of, they started realizing that God gave them wisdom on how to grow plants better than anybody in the world. And they asked the Lord, they said, Lord, why we want our strawberries to be a witness to you. We want our bok choy to be a witness to you. So God, when we created these LED lights and we put them on the plants, how can we grow them better so people would see your good works that glorify our Father in heaven? And you know what the Lord said to them in an impression? He said, wake up your strawberries early in the morning, subtly, and turn off your lights slowly in the evening and follow the algorithms of the sun. 
because that's how I designed them to grow. Every other grow lights out there for strawberries were pop on all the time, 24 seven. Was making these strawberries just go, 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 go. Okay, stunted their growth. The strawberries that grew in an algorithm of the sun produced and they were the most robust, big, huge, juicy, awesome beef stew. No, strawberries. And they were so awesome. And they got a contract and they sold all their grow lights, which produced money for the veterans, which give us a way to do wraparound services and housing for veterans and working with different nonprofits to alleviate the need of a whole people group in a city. Because they said, Lord, whatever's in my hand to do, I give it to you. That was the we of what they did. Those lights went on to outfit the Tesla factory. There was the former solar city in the Bay Area. The veterans actually made the lights for the, for the Tesla factory. So these were good lights. These were quality. These were awesome because they were good at what they did. I have a feeling that you're good at what you do. And I have a feeling that the Lord would come to you today and give you inspiration, calling, creativity, not just asking you to repave the, the parking lot or rebuild the roof or traditional things that you might have done in a church before. But I believe in this church and the calling to this is say, hey, who are you? Who are the me that you are so we can be better? And I have a feeling that God will give you inspiration and creativity. Amen. I'm going to end with this scripture and, and the worship team is going to come up um, so they can make me sound more spiritual. Um, so, you know that's how it works, right? Whoever possessed precious stones gave, they gave the gold, they gave the acacia wood, they gave the ram skin, the dyed and red materials. And God said, I will show you the pattern of how to build. God said, I will do it according to my will. The last part of that scripture says, besides in my devotion to the temple of God, I now give my personal treasure of gold, silver for the temple of my God over and beyond everything I provided for his holy temple. So get that, besides my devotion to the temple of God. So besides just coming to church, besides just giving my tithe, besides just what I feel is the bare minimum of Christianity or, or the good enough Christianity, I now give my personal treasures. Your personal treasures, guys, you are a treasure trove of God's kingdom. You are the treasure in every industry you're in. If we're ever going to see life transformation, it's going to be because of you. 3,000 talents of gold and 7,000 talents of refined silver for the overlaying of the walls of the buildings, for the gold work and the silver work, and all for the work to be done by craftsmen. Do you get that? The last part, not by clergy, but by craftsmen. Anybody that does anything with their hands. First Chronicles 29, one through five. Now, who is willing to consecrate themselves to the Lord today. Let's go ahead and close our eyes. Lord, we see how you've built through others throughout history. We see how you've impacted cities and towns to the glory of God for your will, for your purposes. Now we ask the same question, Lord, that you asked in Chronicles 29. Now who is willing to consecrate themselves to the Lord today? so we can be the we in Kalihi to impact our city. So Lord, we, we come to you with our 75 pounds or 34 kilograms, which is a measure of one talent. And we say, Lord, would you use our talents? Would you move, use our crafts? Would you use the stuff that's characteristic to who we already are? We don't need to become more Christian. We don't need to become more um, overtly, weirdly godly. We just need to be the us that you made us to be. And in that, Lord, would you use us? Would you use the we of this church to impact a dying world? May our light so shine that they would see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. And if you're willing to do that and consecrate yourself to the Lord today and offer what you have to the Lord, to pray that dangerous prayer of, Lord, whatever I have, whoever I am, I give to you then just go ahead and say amen. 
Amen. Bless you guys. Do you think that's the way this is? I love Mike's heart that he brings to this of saying, hey, the church is great. We love what's happening at the church, but it's not just about the church. It's about us doing what's going on outside in the walls, outside of the walls, in the real world out there. Um, you know, when he's talking about going from survival to stability, all of us remember scrapping through our early years, right? Coming out of high school, trying to figure out what life is like, and then moving from that to even significance. God, how can I use whatever I have for your glory, your benefit? I think it's what it's all about. Now, maybe you listen to this, you go, hey, that's cool, but I can't build Hawaiian homes, yeah? And I don't have enough know-how to make LED lights to make, you know, washing machines for homeless and then veteran. And like, it's huge, huge, big picture, and it's awesome. So what can, what can I do as a normal person? Really, the bottom line of what Mike is saying, and I've been so encouraged by hearing this, is whatever God has given you, use that. You know, like when someone says, oh, come over for dinner. What should I bring? And they say to me, bring whatever you like. That's like the worst for me. I'm like, so you can get everything from Doritos to last week's meatloaf to Liliha Bakery. I don't know. It's almost like saying, hey, whatever is in your fridge or your cupboard or whatever you got, just bring what you got. No need to go to Liliha Bakery. No need to go do this. No need to go do Just bring what you got. We'll make that work. It's kind of like what God is saying to us, similar to what Pastor Mike was sharing with us. Whatever you got, we can use that. So, for example, if you're an engineer and you have that kind of mind, hey, maybe you got to make the Lolo van, right? Maybe you're different. Maybe you have your own business and you can bless people through your business. Maybe you're good with photography and you can use your photo skills. And some people in our church do that. And they take great pictures of things that are happening and it encourages others. Or perhaps just simply where you're at. Can you read a kid's book? Because there's elementary schools that are looking for volunteers to read kids' books to kids during class. It says, Manini are small or as big and wide as God is calling for you to, to be. You know what it means in the end? It's your heart attitude. It's our heart attitude to be able to say, better we than just me. Would you say amen to that? Hey, let's all stand together as we finish our time this morning. So grateful for Pastor Mike, for his wife Ashley, for their wonderful kids. If you want to get to know them, they'd love to talk story with you after service. Um, I don't know if you heard, but we have beef stew. It hasn't been mentioned at all this morning, ever. But uh, you want to support the Women's Ministry Fundraiser. In the end, man, we're just so grateful for what God is doing at our church, and especially what God is doing outside of our church by using people like me and you. Hey, let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that you call us to use whatever you've blessed us with already. So we bring the gift that you've given us, the talent, whatever it might be. We bring our experiences. We bring our jobs, our companies, our businesses, our coworkers, our friends, our neighbors, just the relationships you've already given us. Help us to have eyes to see how we can use that to love people and make a difference in our world. Better we than me. It's all about what you've already done, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, let's thank God one more time as we finish up. Thank you, Lord. Don't forget, if you're new, uh, come see us at the Metro Hub. We'd love to talk with you. We've got a free gift for you because you're new today. We always close by singing the Hawaiian doxology together. Let's sing Ho'onani. If you don't know the words on the screen over here, that's our, on, that's our way we usually close out. Let's sing. Ho'onani kama kua Have a great day and a good week in the Lord. God bless you all. See you next week. And I raise a hallelujah. I raise a
They've made me feel like a prisoner. They've made me feel set free. They've made me feel like a criminal. Made me feel like a king. They've lifted my heart. My words be true.
give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. And great Sure.